Well, good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, and a warm welcome, as I have just been saying to those of you in the room, to this penultimate seminar of the Axon Johnson Centre for the Study of Classical Architecture uh, here in Downing College, Cambridge, the penultimate seminar of our, our next term, and therefore until actually the, the autumn when we resume. Uh, but do join us next week as well, um, when we have uh, Professor Kemi Brothers, who's coming from Northeastern University uh, in Boston, and we'll be talking about her new work, her new book, in fact, on Giulio de San Gallo's uh, studies of the ruins of ancient Rome. So do join us next week if you would for that as well. And of course, people online, very warm welcome to you. Um, you're also uh, more than welcome to join us next week for Professor Brothers' talk. But today we have um, a, a colleague of ours, a friend of ours, Dr. Matthew Walker, who's a lecturer in the School of History at Queen Mary College. Uh, Matthew, uh, his first book, 2017, I think I'm right in saying, Matthew? Is that right? yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, Architects <laughs> and Intellectual Culture in the Post-Restoration Period. Have I got that right? Yes. Yes? Post-Restoration England. Post-Restoration England, yes. Yeah, which my publisher uh, insists on the post, I think. Uh, post. <laughs> Oxford University Press was a, <clears throat> was a dazzling debut for uh, a, young, a young scholar like Matthew, who's already mm -hmm. held posts uh, in addition to his current one at the University of London, at uh, the University of York, and at the University of Oxford as well. But today, what Matthew's going to talk to us about <clears throat> is actually his new work, <clears throat> excuse me, um, which relates in part to a, a rather brilliant article that he published in Architectural History in 2013 with the unknown name of Francis Vernon, a traveler to Greece in the late 17th century, who's sending back his ideas about Greek architecture to the Royal Society. Quite a revelatory article that was, Matthew. And Matthew's been following it up with uh, work towards a book on this uh, sort of prehistory of the Greek revival in the long 17th century, most recently with the benefit um, of a fellowship he's held at the British School at Athens uh, last autumn. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say we're twice, if not thrice, grateful to you, Matthew, for this seminar today. First of all, because uh, it's a postponed seminar uh, when the, the storms in yeah. England put you off a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Secondly, because you were a speaker at our symposium yesterday <laughs> and to uh, be called into action twice in two <laughs> days is, is, is beyond the call of duty, I would say. And thirdly, because I happen to know you're suffering from a bit of a cold. Um, so your voice may not be quite high. <laughs> I'll, I'll survive. So um, you'll survive. <clears throat> but um, so thank you so much for speaking to us today about the Greek revival of prehistory. Matthew Walker. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Frank. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for the Axon Johnson Foundation for giving me this opportunity to present this research to you. Um, yes, it's reading week in Queen Mary, but as you observed yesterday, Frank, it's been speaking week for me. Mm -hmm. My voice will hopefully hold up. We will see. Um, OK, <clears throat> so it's a statement of fact that the Greek revival in European architecture began in the late 18th century and truly flourished in the 19th. I also think it is incontestable that the movement began as an intellectual proto-archaeological one. Does that work? Yeah, like that. Yeah. Is it plugged in? Yes, but then they always like to go. So the on switch. Oh, Oh, okay, how do I do it? I'll press that. Okay. Um, the publication of Julian David Lacroix, Le Ruins de Pupil de Monument de la Grèce, in 1758, and volume one of Stuart, um, James Stuart and Nicholas Revett's Antiquities of Athens in 16, 1762, radically transformed Western European conceptions of ancient Greek architecture. And their detailed, measured drawings of ancient buildings in Athens and beyond allowed architects to emulate ancient Greece with confidence and accuracy as we see Wilkins doing here and down in college, a very representative Greek revival building. Um, these two publications by and large created the Greek revival um, and have always been seen as a watershed in European architecture, probably correctly. Well, I think correctly. However, Leroy, Stuart and Rivette were not the first Western Europeans to see the ruins of ancient Greece. They were not the first to write about them and publish images of them. And indeed, the Greek revival architects who followed them were not the first to claim that they were designing buildings that were, according to their architects, Greek in some way. There have been many others before them. It's long been assumed, however, that while these earlier accounts of Greece and its ruins are of cultural and intellectual historical significance, they do not in any way fundamentally change how Western Europe perceived of ancient Greek architecture. 
Likewise, buildings purporting to be Greek in some way prior to the 1750s are usually considered the naive works of architects with serious deficiencies in their knowledge of what Greek architecture actually looked like. These two images seem to reveal much, I think. On the left here, an image of the Parthenon, published in 1678 by Jacob Spon in his account of his travels in Greece. Um, and to say this lacks the precision and accuracy of the image on the right of the theatre of Marcellus in Rome by Antoine de Gaudet, or those produced by Leroy, Stuart and Rivette, is an exercise in stating the obvious. And no architect with the best one in the world could really use this image as an accurate source for a building. By contrast here, the Degaudet's print reveal, reflects the standard of European illustrations of Roman architecture by the late 17th century. Likewise, if you look at architectural designs that were claimed to be in some way Greek by their architects, we encounter, to our eyes at least, a confused picture. This is a design for an unexecuted rustic garden temple made by Nicholas Hawksmore in the 1720s. In the annotations, Hawksmore tells us that the design had been inspired by his readings of Herodotus, a comfortably Greek source, Alongside two Roman writers, Pliny and Varro, were most certainly cited here as authorities on the ancient Campania and rural life in the ancient world. And Hawksmore also tells us that this is, the design has Greek compartments. Um, and this is a, a the quote here comes from a letter um, that he writes at the same period. Again, he refers to the ornaments of this design or the apertures after the Greek manner. Um, he means the dress so in details. To our eyes, those details look decidedly Roman, if not Italian, um, with apertures in the form of Venetian windows, uh, cartouches playing the part of exaggerated keystones, and a pantheon-like dome on the top. This appears to have been designed by somebody with very little idea of what ancient Greek architecture actually looked like. To sum up then, the European understanding of ancient Greek architecture prior to Lecoy, Stuart, and Rabette was a confused picture. And this has led architectural historians to, in general, dismiss the late 17th and early 18th century reception of ancient Greek architecture as one of ignorance and generalization. Here, for example, are two exceptionally good architectural historians and an okay one, concluding on what I have just been talking about. So here's Joe Morgan Crook um, in 1972. Uh, for the 17th and 18th centuries, the Grecian was usually a synonym for classical. Um, to the 18th and early 19th centuries, often enough, Grecian simply meant Arcadian. Gradually, however, the use of a more precise nomenclature, nomenclature permeates downwards from the professional archaeologists. Christopher Drew Armstrong, in his fantastic book, On Le Roy, was published in 2012, observes, although Vitruvius informed his readers that the orders originated in Greece, neither he nor any of the aforementioned authors made much effort to determine what Greek architecture actually looks like. Until the 18th century, the arts of the ancient Greece and Rome were generally regarded as a uniform block. And me, um, in 2013, uh, now widely had no notion that Greek buildings were either the fountainhead or the apogee of classical architecture would not be formulated until the late 18th century. There was little sense in late 17th century writing of an awareness of a development in ancient architectural style from the Greek period to the Roman. So, as the Hawksmore drawing appears to show, and the Spon illustration can no way refute, architects and writers prior to the 1750s did not have a clear sense that ancient Greek architecture might have been different from the Roman, and there was little sense of any stylistic chronology in ancient built form. I think that these positions are all, in many respects, correct, but something has always bothered me about them, even when I wrote this a few years ago. As Drew Armstrong observes here, Vitruvius, the Roman author on architecture, who of course, more than any other ancient writer, shaped 17th century understanding of the built fabric of the ancient world, was at least clear that the Romans owed their architectural formation to the Greeks. And if we go back to Vitruvius and other ancient authors that the 17th century knew well, we find moments where they do indeed hint at differences between Greek and Roman architecture and suggestions even of some form of ancient architectural chronology. Um, here's Pliny. Uh, in ancient times, a proportion, note Pliny has an antiquity, he, has, he refers to ancient times. A proportion was observed that the breadth of a temple should be three times the height of columns. It was in the earlier temple of Diana at Ephesus um, that the columns were for the first time mounted on molded bases and crowned with capitals. It was decided that the lower diameter of the columns should be one eighth of their height, and the height of the molded bases should be one half of the lower diameter. Um, and then Vitruvius uh, tells us, or actually I'll I'll, I'll look at Pliny first. Note here Pliny's conception of an earlier way of doing something, earlier than his period, and earlier, earlier than the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, as he knew it, which was a Hellenistic building. 
And here's Vitruvius. Now, three kinds of bricks are produced. The first, called the Lydian in Greek, is the one our people use and is a foot and a half long and a foot wide. Greek buildings are built with the other two kinds, one of which is the Pentadorum, the other the Tetradorum. And here's Vitruvius telling us that the Greeks used different sized bricks to the Romans, which, though not particularly helpful when it comes to actually envisaging any differences between Greek and Roman buildings, does at least tell us that they were different in some constructional way. Add to this, Vitruvius is account of the origins of the order, which very clearly took place in ancient Greece, evolved from one another many centuries before him. One can get a sense of some form of architectural development in the ancient world, even if, as Drew Armstrong correctly observes, the specific nature of that development is not in any way precisely communicated by these Roman authors. But there were early modern authors who picked up on this, especially Vitruvius' claim that the orders of architecture of such importance in the 17th century originated in Greece and may have been perfected by them. So I'm now going to very briefly set out a sort of general inventory of Western European knowledge of ancient Greek built form prior to the moment in the late 17th century when British and French travellers encountered it properly. Um, I'll start very briefly in uh, the Italian Renaissance. As we might expect, there was considerable humanist interest in ancient Greek architecture and in the Quattrocento at least some knowledge of actual Greek buildings, most notably in the, in the famous recordings of Syriaco de Ancona, who visited Athens and other sites in the 1430s. But as Deborah Howard has shown, by the 16th century and in Venice at least, the one Italian state we might expect to find some knowledge of the actual built form of ancient Greece, we get a muddled picture. Here's Sirlio on the subject. Certainly anyone who has seen the wonderful works built by the Greeks, nearly all of which have disappeared, demolished by time or war, would judge that the Greek works were better by far than those of the Romans. Sirlio, who seemed to have had very little idea what ancient Greek building looked like, having not only never seen one, but also apparently operating under the assumption that they no longer, no longer existed, still felt that they were better in some way than surviving Roman examples that he knew so very well. And what this observation really shows is um, a deep engagement with Vitruvius rather than ancient Greek built form, coming as it does in the middle of a discussion of Vitruvian distaste for Roman meddling with the original Greek authors, orders. And it also, of course, reveals the ignorance of Western Europe when it came to the material and built culture of Greece in the mid 16th century, when the borders of the Ottoman Empire remained fairly securely shut to Westerners, including uh, Venetians. <coughs> Fast forward a century, and we get on the face of it a similar picture, one of a perceived Greek superiority in spite of contemporary ignorance of the specifics of that superiority. The Greeks, who were the first inventors of them, and with them alone, they happily arrived to their supremest perfection. He's talking about the orders here. Um, there is not in the whole universe anything worthy of renown, which that divine country did not once produce in its height of excellency. Let us not then forsake the paths that these excellent guides have traced before us, but pursue their footsteps and generously avow that the few gallant things we, that have yet reached out to us are due only as derived from them. For my part, I find it so excellent and peculiar a beauty um, as in the Greek, the three Greek orders, and I am hardly at all concerned with the other two of the Latin comparison. This is when Frère de Chambry, um, an extremely influential author on architecture in the late 17th century, especially in England, where his parallel of ancient modern architecture, as translated was by John Evelyn, was read for many, many years after his death. And this idea that the original three orders had been created by the Greeks, the Doric, the Ionic, the Corinthian, was superior to the two orders that the Renaissance had assigned to Roman invention, the Tuscan and the Composite which were corruptions of the three purer orders. Had a huge, this idea had a huge amount of traction in architectural theory at the turn of the 18th century. Indeed, as I've argued in my first book and will continue to argue in the next, Freya through Evelyn's translation is the key theoretical influence on English architectural thought in the first half of the 18th century and may very well be one of the most important reasons for the Anglosphere's enthusiastic adoption of Greek form over a century after he wrote these words. I'll save that for the book. In the meantime, though, I want to focus on the last line here, a fairly throwaway comment relating to Greek temples built in the Doric order. The island of Delos built another very famous one to the god Apollo in memory of his birth in that place, and of which there are this day some vestiges remaining. By Freyot's time, perhaps 100, you know, writing 100 years after Serlio, there were reports beginning to creep into Western Europe that perhaps some of those Greek works of the supremest perfection with their original gallant orders 
might survive after all. Indeed, I think by the time that Freya wrote these words, Greek architecture in Western Europe was increasingly taking on the characteristics of that classic Donald Rumsfeldian category, the known unknown. In that it was known to be out there, but its actual nature remained something of a mystery. So 17th century writers were aware that Greek and Roman buildings might differ, and that the, that difference prin principally manifested itself in one of quality. The Greeks were better architects than the Romans, who represented a decline in standards since classical Greece. And by the mid 17th century, there was an awareness that the evidence for this lay within the boundaries of an empire that was increasingly becoming more accessible to Western visitors. Enter the travelers. <clears throat> Beginning in the 1670s, a significant number of French and English travelers entered Ottoman Greece and Asia Minor, saw ancient ruins and wrote accounts of them. I'll start with these three. Uh, one Englishman, George Wheeler, um, his French traveling companion, Jacob Spon, and the slightly late, later French traveler, Joseph Piton de Tournefer. Before we look at their accounts, it must be stated that none of these travelers entered Greece solely to look at architecture. They had numerous interests beyond that subject. Indeed, all three, and Tournefer in particular, were avid botanists, and he tended to prioritize the flora, flora and fauna over ruins. They also, like all travel writers in the period, obsessively recorded the habits and customs of local people, often at the expense of recording what survived of the ancient world. Nonetheless, all three do have much to say on antiquity. Spon and Wheeler visited Athens in the 1670s, and their accounts of the city and its acropolis are amongst the first detailed ones by Western authors. All three traveled in the Aegean archipelago and visited Delos. And they all toured the eastern coast of Asia Minor, found their way to Ephesus and to other Greek and indeed Roman sites there. So, <clears throat> what do they say upon encountering this known unknown, the Freya's vestiges? Well, in general, I would say most of the time their accounts seem to merely confirm what they might have thought prior to arriving in Greece. The ancient Greek architecture was really, really good. Here's Wheeler's account of the Parthenon, which he saw prior, remember, prior to the 1687 explosion. Um, it's fairly typical in this respect. The Temple of Minerva, which is the, part of the Parthenon, the chief goddess of the Athenians, which is not only the chief ornament of the citadel, but absolutely for both matter and art, the most beautiful piece of antiquity remaining in the world. It is situated about the middle of the citadel, of the citadel and consists altogether of admirable white marble. The plane of it is about twice as long and 98 foot six inches broad, it hath an ascent, which by way of five degrees or steps, um, which seem to be so contrived to serve as a basis to the portico, which is supported by channeled pillars of the Doric order, erected round them without any other basis. So we are told about its beauty, the basics of its architecture, and Wheeler notes that the fact, the fact that the columns of the Parthenon are fluted, channeled, and without basis, two features that we would now recognize as being essential, of course, to the Greek Doric order. He at no point suggests that he sees this form of the Doric as being in any way different from the Roman, and he had been to Rome, or that recorded by Vitruvius, which we would now, of course. Likewise, other authors seem to have gone with a preconceived idea of ancient Greek architecture being beautiful, and that is what they find. Though some, 24 in particular, seem to emphasize in their own limited way the potential simplicity and nobility of what they find. In this respect, they seem to carry the same preconception that shapes Freya's categorization of the Greek handling of architectural form as being in some way purer, more original, and finer than that of the Romans. Here's 24 on the island of Naxos, um, looking at, uh, looking at the, what is it? Uh, the Temple of Apollo on, on Naxos. About a musket shot from the island, says 24, near the castle, rises out a little rock, on which is seen a very beautiful gate of marble. This gate, which consists but of three pieces of white marble, is remarkably noble in its simplicity. Two pieces form the mountains, the third, the length one. Admittedly, this doesn't really tell us much about the building beyond its nobility, and 24 makes no effort to try and date this structure. In fact, it's very early, it's mid sixth century. But nonetheless, it represents confirmation that Greek architecture was, as Vitruvius said it should be, of great sophistication. Likewise, on the nearby island of Delos, 24 sees some more noble workmanship in the form of these arches. <clears throat> Again, noble simplicity. Um, but here, I think we begin to see the limitations of how these travelers record these buildings. For 24 here uses the same language to describe two buildings, this on the Temple of Naxos, with completely different functions that were probably built 400 years apart. 24 doesn't actually say what kind of building he thought this was, um, uh, or he, what he thought these arches came from, 
for its worth, Spon and Wheeler thought it was a temple. It's actually a late Hellenistic gymnasium seen here in its current much reconstructed state. And this brings us on to the key question of dating ruins, which Tornifor typically fails to do. When they did attempt to date ancient structures, travelers in this period used three different kinds of sources. Ancient authors, such as Pausanias and Strabo, whose accounts are not always clear to say the least. Local guides, the importance of which I think I'm only just beginning to realize here actually. And inscriptions on the buildings themselves, which tended to be the most reliable source. But all of these brought problems and all got travelers into trouble when it came to chronology. So before I go on to suggest that in some respects, the accounts of Greek architecture prior to Leroy, Stuart and Rivette are more sophisticated than had previously been thought. It's time to acknowledge just how chaotic and error laden they can be, especially when it came to chronology and the potential differences between the architecture of differing periods in the ancient world. In other words, it's time for the early travellers to Greece architectural analysis blooper reel. So, Spon and Wheeler couldn't decide which of these is the proper layer. Uh, Pausanias describes the proper layer as follows. There is but one entrance to the Acropolis, the gateway, the proper layer, has a roof of white marble, and down to the present day is unrivaled for the beauty and size of its stones. <clears throat> well, Bulia Gate was clearly an entry, even if we, would if we now know it was built 700 years later. Whereas the building on the right here might better match Pausanias' description of the proper layer as being unrivaled for beauty, though it would not have looked like a gateway to 17th century eyes, I think. In the end, Spon and Wheeler opted for the latter and got it right. But Pausanias' words here continue to cause trouble. Over 50 years later, the English traveler Charles Perry would leave the Acropolis in 1740, completely convinced that the Bulay Gate was Pausanias' proper layer. To continue, uh, Spon and Wheeler both thought that the western pediment frieze of the Parthenon dated from the Hadrianic period because they noted, they noted that this uh, bearded man here looks like that Roman emperor who had done so much to restore Athens, and the woman sitting next to him happened to resemble his consort, the Empress Sabina. In fact, they both flirted with the idea that the entire peristyle of the column of the temple, everything except the keller, was Roman in date, but, but in the end decided not. Um, <clears throat> moving on, all visitors to the Acropolis, indeed, and indeed Leroy, Stuart, and Rivette themselves assumed that the second century AD Odeon of Herodes Atticus, um, seen here on the left, built in the Roman period, was in fact the Greek theatre of Dionysus that Pausanias made reference to being on the south slopes of the Acropolis. The real one would turn up in the 19th century, having been buried for centuries, at which point it was realized that the structure on the right was so much later. And to our eyes, I think this mistake really does suggest an unawareness of the fundamental forms of Greek architecture, a profound inability to distinguish between the brick and actual arches of Roman construction and the open air theatres of the Greek world. <clears throat> um, as does this one, back to 24 on the island of Delos, where he decided based on the sheer number of pieces of marble that now littered the area that he knew was once the famous sanctuary of Apollo, that it must have been an enormous domed structure. In fact, he was looking at the remains of at least three separate temples here. Had he known this, he probably wouldn't have tried to turn the entire area into a huge 5th century Greek version of the Pantheon. Turning to the Greek sites of Asia Minor, no other building causes as much chronological chaos as the legendary Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, known, of course, to all early modern writers through the account given by Pliny. When Spon, Wheeler, and subsequently Tony Four were taken to the site by local guides, they were shown, shown the ruins of the, Greek, of the great structure near the ancient harbor. When the actual temple was excavated in the 19th century, over a mile away to the east, it was realized that the ruins that early travelers had all assumed as being those of the Artemisian were in fact those of the harbor gymnasium and bath complex built during the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian at the end of the first century AD. So this acceptance of local guides claims led to the belief that Major temples of the early Hellenistic period, which is when Pliny dated the Temple of Artemis II, in Asia Minor all featured brick and ashlar vaulting. And this mistake then subsequently infected travelers' understandings of other sites. So here's uh, Wheeler um, amongst the ruins of the Roman site of Alexander Troas. Um, I won't read this out, um, but basically, you know, he, he says, well, it looks just the same as the Temple of Artemis, so it must be therefore a Temple of Artemis. And um, he's right, they do look the same because they're both Roman gymnasia. <clears throat> and uh, this mistake just kept coming back to bike travelers of ancient buildings in the region, as every time they saw something that looked like the Temple of Diana at Ephesus, aka the Harbour Gymnasium, they assumed it was the foundations of a Greek temple rather than a Roman civic building, 
Um, here, uh, for example, is Richard Pocock um, in Aphrodisias in 1740, um, having been to Ephesus a month before, seeing a building that he thought was a temple to Aphrodite on the grounds that it was built something after the manner of that uh, Ephesus. And again, there's a reason why this structure looks like what he thought was the Temple of Artemis. It's a Roman bathhouse from the Hadrianic period. And finally, this um, constantly repeating bad penny of a mistake found its way back home and into contemporary writing on ancient architecture by architectural theorists rather than travelers. Here's Christopher Wren, no less, under the impression that the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus had vaults, um, which Wren, with a degree of perhaps structural sensibility missing from the traveler's accounts, assumed must have been part of the foundations. He says that they were probably, travelers tell us that they were heaps of ruins and large vaults, which were probably the substructions of the colonnade. The travelers he's referring to here are Spon and Wheeler. Given Wren's proclivity to use brick arch construction in the foundations of his buildings, most notably his deployment of inverse casemary arches below the ground floor arcade of Trinity College Library, this observation is worth further investigation, I think. But I will do that in the book. Right, <clears throat> so having given you a flavor of the mistakes these travelers made, and there are many, many more, um, I now want to spend the rest of this paper identifying moments when not only did they get things right, but where they identified moments in ancient Greek architecture which hinted at a much bigger story. The creation of a canon of ancient stylistic development, a story that traditionally has always been, has always begun with Le Roy, Stuart, and Rebecca. So far, I've mainly focused on Wheeler and Tournefort. Of the three travelers I've discussed so far, it was Spon who shows the most sensitivity towards the appearance of ancient architecture and what it could tell him about the origins, its origins and its development. His spawn, alongside Wheeler, engaging in some baiting of a major Athenian moment, monument, the Graduate Monument of Lysicrates, known to all travellers in this period as the Lantern of Demosthenes, due to an erroneous belief that its construction had been brought about by the great orator and the fact that it looked like a lantern. As both Wheeler and Spawn observe, it be, if it had been built by Demosthenes, then that would date it to the fourth century BC. However, even if, as they also speculate, the role of Demosthenes in its construction was a fabrication, an inscription on the monument itself also pointed to a date during his lifetime. His Wheeler, noting that the archon on the inscription uh, referred, uh, that the inscription refers to lived in the mid fourth century. So this, this character, Yunaitas, who's, who's mentioned in the, um, in the inscription, uh, they know he was archon of Athens um, in the second year of the hundred of the Olympiad. Thus, the monument seemed to comfortably date from around 4th to 30 BC, and Wheeler leaves it there. Spon, on the other hand, uses this date to establish a fact about the development of a particular feature used in ancient built form, the fluting of columns, or the channeling of pillars, as he calls it. As I have said in the Relation of Athens printed before my trip, it's another book he'd, he'd written on the subject, fluted columns were not older than the time of the Roman emperors, and therefore these cannot be of the time of Demosthenes, but I was deceived by a passage that I was told in, was in Vitruvius. And in fact, he makes no mention of it. I have since recognized through my travels that fluted columns are of the oldest antiquity. Indeed, they are. So, says Spon, he had been under the impression that the fluting columns began in the, the Roman imperial period, but here was seemingly conclusive evidence of it being a much, much older practice. And this is a nice example, I think, of the empirical dating of an ancient architectural feature a good 80 years prior to Le Roy. Even more interesting is Spon's reaction to this time. As Western European knowledge of the Greek temples of southern Italy and Sicily remained extremely limited in the late 17th and indeed early 18th century, the Temple of Apollo at Corinth was really the only properly archaic building that writers on Greek architecture ever encountered. As a result of this unfamiliarity, all visitors to the site noted its strange proportions. Wheeler, for example, commented on the fact that the proportions of the Doric columns here at Corinth were much squatter than those of the great temples of Athens. But once again, he left it there. Spon, on the other hand, upon seeing this temple, dips his toe into the water of the stylistic dating of ancient architecture. Waters that have traditionally been seen as occupied by those of the writers of the 1750s and beyond. These columns seem to be, to me, to be most, to be the most ancient than any I have ever seen, due to their extraordinary proportion. Because although they are of the Doric order, they do not have the same proportion as others in Athens and elsewhere. Pliny says the Doric must be six times as high as the diameter of the foot of the column, 
Yet these are not four times as much. Spawn doesn't take it any further than this, but he seems convinced. And he says he thought that this was an earlier form of the Doric due to the proportional discrepancy between this and the temples of Athens that deployed the same order and that he knew to be fifth century through his readings of Pausanias, Thucydides, and other authors on the ancient Athenian polis. This then is further evidence of a desire to date the buildings of ancient Greece and to treat, crucially, to do it stylistically. <clears throat> we also find um, in the accounts of ancient Greek architecture from the late 17th century, a recognition that perhaps some of the details of the building that were comfortably from what we would now call the classical Greek period might differ from those that came after them. Here's a minor example from Wheeler um, of potentially strange goings on in the minutiae of the fifth century Ionic order of the Erechtheion. Um, in his description of this, Wheeler reveals that he had never seen an example of this order with, its band, with this band of relief carved and theming motifs running around the columns directly underneath the capital. Um, he says they are something different from any I have seen of that order and seem to be a mixture between it and the Doric order. Comparing the Erechtheion to Roman examples of the Doric order and Ionic order here from the bust <coughs> of Diocletian and the temple of Fortuna Virilis on the top, we can see what he means. Um, and in the process, identify in Wheeler a familiarity with Roman architectural form that sometimes meant he could identify discrepancies between it and the Greek. But there's one traveler in this period that really began to analyze carefully the details of ancient Greek building and perhaps begin to differentiate between them and his knowledge of Roman examples to a, degree, a greater degree than any of his contemporaries. So I'm now going to talk about Vernon, who I, um, who, who I have been working on for some time now. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a portrait of him um, because, well, for reasons I'm about to tell you, um, but here is um, an, an image from his amazing travel journal that survives in the Royal Society Library. And here, um, I found this a few months ago, here is his name cut onto the interior keller wall of the Temple of Hephaestus. Um, it was a very exciting moment when the American school let me in and I found it. Anyway, um, so uh, <clears throat> Vernon was an English traveller who journeyed to Greece with Spon and Wheeler, but went his separate way once he got there. He reached Athens before them, spent several months in the city before traveling to, through Asia Minor, down the Black Sea coast and into Persia. He was murdered in 1677 in Esfahan. And unlike Spon, Wheeler and Tornifor never got to return and publish a major account of his travels. Though he tells us in his correspondence that he, that was his plan had he returned. Instead, uh, this, this is all we have of Vernon's time in Athens. His, um, a brief letter that he wrote back to Athens, his signature on, on the Temple of Hephaestus, um, <clears throat> and his travel journal. The journal is a remarkable account, I think, of life in Ottoman Greece. And it shows that Vernon was a traveler with a very great interest in ancient architecture. Yes, this is a plan. This is a plan. Of course, um, you may spot that it's a plan that's gone wrong. Um, it's a plan of the Erechtheion, but Vernon's made it symmetrical. This is because he never saw the Caryatid porch. Uh, the Caryatid porch was covered by later Ottoman construction in this period. Anyway, if you want to know more about that, ask me later. Um, uh, he, um, he had a very great interest in architecture. Indeed, Spon called Vernon a mathematician and an architect, using the broader late 17th century use of the term to mean not just people who designed buildings, but people who wrote about them and studied them as well. And so in his journal, he gives us something that Spon, Wheeler, and Tornik will never do, plans of buildings. And here is his, again, not particularly great plan, but it's still a plan um, of the Propylaea <coughs> and, yeah, and the Erechtheans above it. Vernon also differed from other travelers in the period due to his tendency to use Vitruvius in his analysis of ancient architecture rather than Pausanias, Strabo, or Pliny. And in his journal, he reveals that whilst in Athens, he not only read Vitruvius every day, but that he seems to have catered his reading of the Roman text around his built visits to ancient buildings. So for example, on the morning of the 4th of November, 1675 in Athens, he said he read fourth book of Vitruve, which includes the account of the Doric orders, and then spent the afternoon viewing the Doric temple of Hephaestus, and maybe vandalizing it. On the 6th of November, Vernon recorded that he had read Vitruvius's fifth, Theatris, in other words, the Vitruvius' fifth book, which described which, which concludes the accounts of ancient theatres. And he then walked out to see Theatre of Bacchus. 
the theater of Dionysus or not actually the Odinum Herodes Atticus for Leon. As a result of this, his analysis of the ancient Romans was focused, careful, and importantly, fundamentally informed by his knowledge of Vitruvius's description of Roman architecture. And subsequently, he was able to spot discrepancies in built form between the temples of Athens and those of Rome that not even Spon saw. Take a small example, um, again relating to the capitals of the Arachthaeum, and in particular, <clears throat> those in the corners of the portico. The ear of the voluta, which was in the corner, was cut in two, and all the section of the voluta appeared in each, says Vernon. This might, might not seem like much, but what Vernon's describing here is that strange effect that one finds on the corner capitals of Greek Ionic porticos. You can see one over there in a minute because Wilkins copies it um, and Downing, where the two volutes collide with each other on the inner angle of the capita. And you can hear, you can see this, I mean, this is a strange, it's a strange thing um, on, the, on the corner of the Erechthan. Um, now the Romans sometimes used this form of corner ionic as well, but they tended instead to position four volutes at 45 degrees around the capital in order to prevent this strange collision. And in doing so, I think they actually created a more satisfactory corner ionic than uh, that the Renaissance would almost exclusively use. But importantly, Vitruvius in his count of the ionic order does not mention how to handle the corner volutes and says nothing about the problem that Vernon identifies here in the Erechtheum. Let's move to the Parthenon to see a better example of Vernon's analysis at work. Here is his description of the cornice. Over the Canartium of the Triglyphi should come the Sophita of the cornice plane. Sorry, this is his, his field notes, so it's not particularly well written, but I will tell you what it means in a minute. But 18 Giaccioli graven on it. And here, these Giaccioli are done on plane tablets some three inches deep, which shoot out under the soffit of the cornice after the manner of medillions and their style. But what this means is that the cornice of the Pantheon was different from Roman Doric temples because it's mutual, its mutuals and its guti drop down. Um, uh, they were articulated on clearly defined tablets, some three inches deep, after, says Vernon, the manner of Modillions, rather than being flush with a soffit, as should have been the case, according to Vitruvius. And here is the illustration of the Doric order in the edition that I know Vernon will have with him in Athens, the Barbaro's, Barbaro's Italian translation. Here is an illustration by Palladio of the uh, Doric order. Um, the corners of the dark order where we see the mutuals are cut up and sized up into the soffit. Vernon says they drop down, really creating the, the, the famous Lego blocks of, of, of the Greek Doric. Um, Vernon then went on to note the same arrangement with clearly defined mutuals that drop down from the cornice could also be found on the Doric orders of the Propylaea and the Temple of Hephaestus. Vernon also, um, well, you can see that that's the Temple of Hephaestus and the Propylaea. <coughs> He also identified perhaps the most characteristic feature of the Greek Doric and the reason why Greek Dorics ultimately feel so different from the Roman handling of the order, the power of their baseless fluted shafts. Here is his account of the Parthenon. The pillars are of Doric order, but have no base. The fustio, by which he means the shaft, rises immediately out of the pavement as if it grew. On the top, the Capato, Capitello has the, only the Abaco of Olo and Ameli without any Colorino immediately under the Ameli begins the Kimbia of the pillar. Again, he's, he's analyzing this fairly closely and identifying things that are missing. Vernon seems to note with genuine surprise um, how the columns of the Parthenon seem to grow out of the ground. But rather than just see this as a metaphor, I think it reveals that Vernon saw and identified how very different these columns were from Roman Doric columns which he'd seen firsthand in Rome a few years earlier, which either had bases or lacked the dramatic tree trunk-like power of the fifth century Doric. As Vernon notes, there is something immediate and arboreal about the Greek Doric and the way it erupts from the plinth of a temple. While he was at it, uh, Vernon also noted that the uh, Parthenon's capitals diverged from the Roman norm as well. They lacked necking, um, Colorino in Vernon's works, that of course he'd read about in his Vitruvius. So what we see in Vernon's travel journal is an attempt to establish moments in the architecture of the temples of Athens where their details differed from Vitruvius and from Rome. Alas though, these tantalizing glances of an architecturally attuned mind at work on the Acropolis in 1675 is all we have from Vernon. His death meant that his journal, his field notes essentially are all that survives. Had he returned safely and published his account of his travels in Greece, 
I am fairly sure that it would have included more architectural discussion than Spon, Wheeler and Tournefort, and it may have included plans of the buildings of Athens. And perhaps, if I may be allowed to speculate, it might have opened up a discussion of the differences between ancient Greek architecture and that of Vitruvius and Rome in a way that the three published authors never did. So to include them, let us return to the dawn of the Greek revival. I hope I have shown in this paper that despite all the mistakes, the lack of chronology and a general unawareness with a few exceptions of what made ancient Greek architecture unique, the idea that Leroy, Stuart and Rivette represented a complete thunderbolt from the blue can at least be um, nuanced, if not questioned. What we see in Spon's attempt to get some grasp of the dates of the development of ancient architecture and Vernon's attempt to disentangle Greek form from the Roman Vitruvian norm represent the very earliest germination of themes that would go on to make the boy Stuart and Revert's texts so significant. These themes are firstly the identification of a chronology of stylistic development in the ancient world, both between the Greek and the Roman and within the Greek itself. The process, a process that Leroy is generally credited with starting and in doing so incidentally, using as one of his key sources, the Temple of Apollo at Corinth, which had prompted Spong to speculate on Greek stylistic development 80 years earlier. And secondly, a recognition that the Greek handling of the orders was in many respects different from that of the Roman rather than just better, as Freya would have claimed. There is a realization that Vernon, this is a realization that Vernon may have made in his detailed analysis of the Parthenon, but one that wouldn't reach full fruition and widespread dissemination until the 1760s. <clears throat> so I think we should view in these, mo in these moments, we see Leroy, Stuart and Rivette, whilst of enormous, enormous significance, should not be viewed in isolation. They were followers in the footsteps of others and they built upon the ideas of others. And whilst those others to us at least seem to hold such inchoate ideas about ancient Greek architecture, they did now and again ask the same questions that the authors of the 1750s and 60s asked and in the process of answering supposedly began the Greek revival. For there are no bolts from the blue in the history of ideas or at least not in the history of architectural ideas. Even the biggest ideas are built on seemingly lowlier foundations. Hegel's formulation of the zeitgeist owes much to Winkelmann's description of the conditions under which classical art flourished in 5th century Greece, a description that in turn lent heavily on Leroy, Stuart and Rivette's attempts to periodize and distinguish the architecture of the ancient Eastern Mediterranean. But this germ of this, the germ of this visually intellectual lineage began earlier in the late 17th century, in the very first British and French accounts of the buildings of antiquity in that region, in the prehistory of the revival of Greek architecture. But actually, I don't want to conclude that. I want to quickly return to Western European architecture at the turn of the 18th century, which is, um, in spite of everything I've just been talking about, my principal area of investigation in all of this. Where does this leave Hawkesmoor and his temples with its supposedly Greek features? Well, this is a question that I'm going to deal with at length in my book, and I don't fully know the answer yet to what Hawkesmoor and his architectural contemporaries really meant when they called something Greek. Though I do suspect, and now I'm going to start, I'm going to do a little bit of speculation to finish. I do suspect that it relates to notions of nobility, grandeur, and quite possibly purity. Again, an idea that we associate with Logier and the second half of the 18th century. Because after all, and amidst the numerous chronological blunders, occasional Vitruvian critique, and very rare moments of Winkelmanian stylistic revelation, there really is nothing in late 17th century accounts of ancient Greek architecture that might have altered the general perception that Greek architecture was the origin of the Roman and therefore of potentially finer extraction than the buildings of Vitruvius's age. You know, as we've seen Tournefort confirming, it was simple. It had noble simplicity. Um, uh, if Traveller's accounts fail to fully represent affirmation that Freya was right in seeing the Greek handling of the orders as being inherently superior to that of the Romans, then at the very least, they don't present significant evidence to the contrary. Indeed, when Spon, Wheeler and Tournefort and Vernon are critical of buildings they encounter, they reserve that criticism exclusively for buildings they know they knew to be of the late antique period or after. So for someone in Hawksmoor's position, and Hawksmoor was very, very well read in travel literature of the day, including that related to Greek, Greece, he'd read all of these things. The position Freya espoused must have seemed generally right that the work of ancient Greek architects represented the original form of antique structural expression it, that it used only three orders 
that its appearance was true to its structure and then it, it precluded too much ostentatious ornamental features. In other words, the travelers provided confirmation that Greek architecture possessed the very same set of values that were already intrinsic in mainstream classical architecture of the late 17th century in Britain and France. And Tournefort used language similar to Freya to describe the Western European, to, to describe the noble and simple works of the ancient Greeks. He was part of a feedback loop that ran between Western architectural European writers with their assumption of the greatness of Greek architecture and a body of description produced by travelers who lacking a proper architectural critical eye confirmed and encouraged those various assumptions. To an architect like Hawksmore, exposed to this loop through his readings of both theorists and travelers, they must have been seen, they must have seemed to be telling him the same thing, that ancient Greek architecture was business as usual. But finally, again, I think that there might be something more prescient here. For the insistence on the Greek as a ref more refined, purer and simpler form becomes, of course, a key foundational theory of the Greek revival proper. Indeed, if some tentative steps in the direction in, of chronology, dating and progression were made, why not some in the direction of purity, simplicity, and originality as well? Those notions that would become sacred to the Greek revival and render Greek architecture as the fountainhead of European architectural culture. But what if it was already there, even before the travelers see it? They go, assuming that it's gonna be simple, and they find it simple. Maybe then that some of the key principles of the Greek revival, um, not just as an intellectual movement, but as a set of built aesthetic values were indeed seeded 100 years prior to their widespread adoption in Western Europe. Thank you.